Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so hi, everyone, and welcome back. Um, we <laughs> We have a wonderful uh, array of uh, presenters now in the second session. Uh, I am here with uh, Charlene Padney. Char, would you like to present yourself? Hi, sure. Uh, my name is Char. I'm a writer for video games. I also teach writing for games. Um, I've had the great pleasure to teach a little workshop at ITU the last two years. And I'm always so impressed with the quality uh, and enthusiasm of the students there. So I'm delighted to be here today to have a look at what they've come up with. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, and uh, we have, um, we should start. I mean, we have uh, very little time and very interesting projects to look at. And uh, our first project uh, is Forgotten. It will be presented by Ryan, who is joining us from the US, actually. So good morning, Ryan. Um, Forgotten is a game about a narrative exploration about uh, uh, living with Alzheimer's disease. It's a very emotional experience that has gotten many accolades so far. So we are very, very excited to hear about it. Ryan? Hey, thanks, Marina. Um, yeah, so I'm Ryan. I worked as a narrative designer on Forgotten, uh, which you're going to see some of the back half of today. Uh, Forgotten is a first person narrative driven game about the experience of having Alzheimer's disease. I worked alongside four others on this seven week prototype together with our creative lead, Marlene Del Reeve, our programmers, Daniel Hansen and Jordi van Opstal, and a dedicated researcher on Alzheimer's symptoms named Ethan Thurston. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now, that screen. Yeah, so don't worry about um, no audio being on this. I'm gonna be talking over the video. Um, yeah, so Making Forgotten, we were interested in this emotional experiment of emulating what we imagined the feeling of cognitive decline might feel like from the first person perspective of someone with Alzheimer's symptoms. Our process included showing early drafts of the project to the local branch of the Alzheimer's Society, who were really supportive of our work. They um, gave us advice pretty early on for ways to frame the experience in a way that respected people with dementia, as this kind of representation particularly in games, I think, can easily slip into a, <laughs> a morally questionable aestheticizing of cognitive decline, maybe edging a little too close to something resembling the horror genre. And we wanted to go for something a little more organic than that if we could. So Merlin and I worked together to design what we think of as a series of playable vignettes uh, to let the player react to being put in certain circumstances with the faculties this character has. And these vignettes are strung together with a story about your character collecting photographs from family members to make a family tree collage out of their pictures. These uh, playable vignettes include time lapses in the middle of activities, uh, finding yourself suddenly in a new location, losing the thread of a conversation and uh, pushing a sense of social isolation by asking players to make dialogue choices with incomplete information, things like that. Uh, we all seemed really interested in how you can encourage certain feelings in players with the right context and interaction design. We found that a surprising number of playtesters responded really strongly to the game, even before we had any art in at all. Um, a lot of people talked to us about, uh, after playing, about how they recognized behavior in this experience that mirrored behavior they had seen in family members suffering from dementia, which was a shockingly common thing uh, that a lot more people had gone through in their lives than we'd expected at the beginning of the project. Uh, something I want to talk about that I think is really interesting about Forgotten is this notion that we're curating an experience that gives players an opportunity to viscerally see the world in parallel to how their character sees the world uh, and invite them to emotionally react in real time uh, with how their character is reacting in shared moments of cognitive dissonance. I think that's a really strong perspective, a really interesting perspective to try to make something from. Um, that other media, of course, has their own sort of ways of actualizing those kinds of things. But I think that the poetics for how games go about doing so first personally are still being figured out by designers. So it's an interesting angle to try to make something from. Um, I think this game benefited from us thinking about the player and the emotional arc of the player in that way while we were making it. 
I was responsible for designing a few of these vignettes, uh, although really that's the kind of thing where Marlene and I don't really remember anymore whose ideas were whose. Um, I wrote all the text in the game and came up with the overarching plot, um, checking very closely with Marlene on those things as I went through. Uh, we were interested in pacing the player's experience of each day along a familiar rhythm of accomplish three tasks in the morning routine, have an interaction with a family member, collect three photos at the end of the day, which was this three and three pattern that we then played with subtly and kind of subverted to reflect our character's uh, gradual state of decline over four non-sequential in-game days. Uh, the prototype went on to have a lot of success. Uh, we were selected for inclusion at the Yonder Play Showcase at the Nordic Game Conference that year. Uh, the Danish Alzheimer's Society promoted the game to their Dementia Friends community in a Alzheimer's awareness campaign. Uh, and more recently, we were humbled to have been nominated for Best Student Game at the Independent Games Festival in San Francisco, which we sadly did not <laughs> end up going to uh, for GDC in March for COVID reasons. Um, but now we're on the lookout for help uh, funding the project to bring Forgotten to completion. Uh, our thinking is that, you know, we made this thing in seven weeks and it had this kind of response. Maybe if we're given a year or so to build off of it, we can make something really special that connects with more folks. Um, we had a lot of ideas for vignettes uh, that folks from the Alzheimer's Society talked to us about uh, that we'd really like the opportunity to build in pursuit of a more finished Forgotten. Um, yeah, so we would really deeply value advice and input from anyone here today if you're intrigued by the game. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Charn, would you like to say a few words? Uh, sure. So uh, thanks so much, Ryan. And it's a super impressive game. Um, I've been following the development of it over the last while, and it's so exciting to see it being nominated for the IGF. I mean, that's really one of the highest honors one can get in indie gaming. So. Um, it was really such a shame that you guys couldn't go and accept <laughs> or be part of that whole experience uh, this year. Yeah, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like I'm interested in a few different things. So first of all, um, like you had a kind of a relationship of some sort with the Danish Alzheimer's Society uh, in terms of like them promoting the, the game. Um, did they give you any specific like insights into things that should be part of your vignettes? Or um, were basically were the things that you already thought were the right was the right ways to go the right ways to go, or did you get valuable input like from the ACE or subject matter experts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we so initially what we had was the sort of thing that you saw toward the beginning of the game or the beginning of that video, right? Which is sort of like just these kind of time distortion things. It's what we initially sort of had as the, the core like idea of the project. And they gave us a lot of ideas for various kinds of things that we probably could emulate with a game, some of which are in the current prototype, a lot of which aren't. Um, one that I'm really excited to try to make, and they had me go through like a test for whether or not you um, are experiencing signs of dementia. And we then put some of the visuals for this in the game. This is a drawing exercise that people um, do because I suppose that while you're, if you're if you're going through a process of like drawing, you know, a series of symbols or something, and you're experiencing Alzheimer's, part of what seems to happen is that people get lost in the process of doing that work. So that, so you give them a relatively simple, you know, two overlapping pentagons or something to draw, and then um, what will happen is that almost certainly, depending on how deep they are in that process, they'll end up kind of skewing that image um, would be unable to like fully, uh, you know, draw it as it's supposed to be drawn. And we thought of ways, oh, we could even have this kind of mini game sequence where you can maybe like draw that. And that was something we like drafted initial idea of scrapped. But what we do have in the game are like those images themselves. There's tests that you've gotten back from uh, your doctor periodically day by day that show kind of worse and worse progression of these images that have gotten kind of more distorted as your character's gone through the game. So they gave us a lot of ideas for, you know, how to sort of respectfully frame something about Alzheimer's, which very heavily influenced all the writing of what we were doing and how we were framing, like, yeah, the the plot, I suppose, of the game, uh, the images of the game. Uh, and that was really viscerally how they, like, helped uh, with this specific project. And then they gave us a lot of ideas for things that we could make if we had time, uh, which we did not, but maybe we can later. 
Yeah, that's yeah. really fantastic. And um, like, it's it's so great to see that like, you know, you're working with the subject matter experts and something that is so important and something that is so, I don't know, uh, meaningful to so many people in, in their everyday lives. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting watching watching the game, like, so also the music is great. I know people couldn't hear that <laughs> but for today, but uh, if you go and watch the trailer on YouTube, which you should, the music is beautiful. It's so uh, so gentle and kind of eerie and uh, definitely give it a listen. But yeah, you know, that's um, kind of yeah, sorry, <laughs> just, just saying. Just sh shout out shout out to Jacob uh, Rasmussen, uh, Merlin's partner, who who made that for us. He's really great. He's a musician <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, and then so there's the like inside of the conversational snippets. You have this really great system where it like it's the conversation snippets are really well designed because you have this trapped feeling i think mm -hmm. of like what is going on who am i where am i what's what is happening um and i was wondering with the time lapses uh because those are also super interesting and give you that feeling of what is happening and how did you balance those so that it would feel uh real yeah that's yeah so we um when we started making drafts of the game, we figured out pretty quick, it's pretty easy to make something that's very annoying. <laughs> uh, and it's hard to make something that's kind of annoying that's also, you know, doesn't take you out of the experience. You know, the, the, there's a right kind of confusion or a right kind of frustration that sometimes I think we hit, sometimes we probably didn't um, over the course of the game. I think for instance, that times where you're being teleported around the um, apartment, like if you're doing a series of, tasks like pick up this object, put it over here, interrupting something like that when you're when the player's attention is focused on like, oh, there's this object that's highlighted, I can pick it up. And they're probably in the process of moving. We timed things to like interrupt when people were already in um, when people were like already in that, you know, process. So mm -hmm. being kind of aware, I guess, I just sort of we, we sort of thought about okay, like there, there's a right time to interrupt people when their focus is on something else and then they're suddenly confronted with this like other context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there were times that I think that we tried doing time skipping that maybe were more or less successful. Like uh, I had mixed feelings about the current implementation of like the dinner scene, for instance. I think it works in the sense that it like gets people to have to like make real time uh, dialogue options in, in a situation where they don't have a lot of context. And I think that that maybe it could even drag on for too long. I don't really know yet. But in any case, like we definitely figured out that some things we were like, yeah, that that is the right way to like disrupt something. And other times we were like, okay, we've experimented with something and maybe it works more or less. But yeah. Super interesting. Thanks so much. And just want to say a really impressive, uh, really impressive entry into <laughs> the world of video games. And uh, great job. <laughs> Thanks, team. Really love yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I agree with uh, everything Shar said, and I would also like to add that one of my favorite parts of Forgotten is that the you, you are not the one that's forgotten. You are surrounded by your family, uh, and it has this um, sad but warm uh, emotion that it is exuding, um, and that was my favorite part. Um, and um, also the the details that you put, like the, the drawings that you mentioned, but not only the fact that the plant is shifting a bit on the windowsill, something that is not part, like not central to the, um, to the interaction, but only in the background, but it is central to your experience. It's, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us. Uh, we will have to let you go now and move on to the next person. Bye. So uh, now we have Louis, uh, who is going to present to us the second ring. Uh, it is a game that asks us what would happen with a world that stops spinning. Uh, Louis is the narrative designer for the second ring and the resident Magic the Gathering podcaster. So uh, welcome, Louis. Thank you very much. So. Uh, as it was said, my name is Louis David Booker Thompson. I was the uh, narrative and game flow designer for the second ring. And now, everybody, uh, we must turn our eyes skywards towards the stars, rather. So without further ado, I present to you the second ring. You were of the stone and salt 
of the earth. You heard the song of creation as its first melodies trailed across the deep sky and the dark ground. You were here at the beginning and now you must rise. Awaken. You and your kin were at peace before that time, lying tranquil, dormant, oblivious. You were part of this world long before anyone harnessed the power of grass and rocks, the plains and mountains, the trees and the soil of your home. The time of peaceful harmony is over, and you have been made a victim of their calamity. Together with your siblings, you were forged into beings of servitude. Your limbs, once scattered and motionless, was tethered to you. You were given a new life, but at what cost? In their greed, they sought to harness the world, harness treasures that had long been in motion, invaluable links in the chain of order, life, rotation. They removed the pieces, link by link, and the chain was broken, and the darkness came. Despairing, realizing too late what they had done, they looked to their wit and fervor to save them. They would reforge the chain, twist it and bend it beyond recognition. Not to save this world, but to save themselves. Now, they are gone, fled beyond your reach, to a place that you might never see. All that is left of them is all around you, their scribbles and their monuments, and your fallen siblings as well. You are here to sustain. You are here, a link in the chain, to pull the circle of life back into motion. You are here because you must, not of your own choice, for you are part of this world, and rotation must continue. Now, you must carry their burden across the land. You must sustain what they have made. You have heard their calling, and you must answer. Answer the song of the second ring. Thank you, Louis. That was a strong ending there. Uh, Char, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, it's a beautiful ending. I love the way it comes out from that, uh, the, the dark and enclosed and claustrophobic little corridors into this vibrant, beautiful landscape. Um, it really I got real uh, vibes of the Talos principle from the, the, and the environment inside of the maze and the narrator voice, which is a really good thing. I love the Talos principle. Um, I was wondering, uh, I have two, two kind of questions. One is about whether those, the language blocks uh, contain puzzles or contain 
yeah, situ puzzle type situations for accessing the outside of the maze. Uh, so the thing was, uh, this was, of course, one of the projects done for, for this semester, which means mm -hmm. that our scope had to be narrowed down a bit. We did uh, initially uh, plan on having some kinds of puzzle in there. Uh, they didn't make it into the game, unfortunately, we have, because we had to scope down. Uh, but we, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> yeah, but we did, we did actually create uh, one of our, our art director, uh, Yelda, actually created that uh, it is a font. Basically, you can actually yeah. type with it if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we had a plan about making some kind of puzzles with it if we, uh, if we are going to you know, extend the project at a later date, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, like, I'm already super intrigued because I'm looking at the little language blocks and, the, and that, that font and everything, and it's giving me good kind of outer, outer wilds vibes as well, like the, with the alien language. I love it. So I would love to see more of kind of puzzle stuff with that. Thank and you. then I also was like wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how you developed the story. Like, where did the idea come from? Like, are you, you, you speak in the, I guess it's you doing the narration in the video. Yes. Yes. It's a super resonant and like beautiful poetic writing and it's very uh, grand and evocative. And, and like, but how did this idea of this story come to you? So the, uh, you? sorry, yeah. So the, uh, the idea originally bloomed actually just from uh, the very base idea, which was uh, the guy who, <laughs> gathered the group in the beginning had this idea which was simply what if we had a world that was situated on a ring inside another ring and inside which was a third ring which was all rotating uh, around a sun basically so we took a lot of inspirations from stuff like halo um uh, there there's a game also called uh, air I, uh, I believe, which we took a lot of uh, aesthetic inspiration from. And the whole idea, uh, at least for me as an outset designer, sprung from like what kind of civilization would would uh, evolve on this kind of world? Uh, what would be their their religion? What would be, what, how would they interact with their world basically? And what would they do if at some point there was some kind of calamity that would require them to, for example, uh, kickstart the ring back like this whole thing is about rotation because all of the rings are constantly rotating and so their great calamity would be the stop of rotation and that was that was basically the way the narrative evolved um, it went through several iterations uh, and several <laughs> different yeah several different prototyping uh, experimentations and then basically ended on on what you saw before you yeah well, I mean, I am super intrigued, and I I would really like to uh, play it when it's when it's when it's out or finished or available in the world. Uh, it is available is on it currently. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Can you yeah. tell everyone uh, the? Uh yeah, the uh, you could go to. Oh my lord, this is unprofessional. Um, <laughs> uh, there is an itch link. Ooh, it should actually be on the on the project thing in Twitch. I think now it was updated okay. like last night, uh, so it should be there. It should be you should be able to find it through Summer Games, basically. Okay, everyone, go check it out. Uh, I'm gonna check it out. Thank you so much, Shelley. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Thank you. And the writing is beautiful too. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Char. Um, I also have one uh, small comment. Um, the the detail that you put into the world the way you thought about how religion uh the religion of those people the ecosystem of the world and so on uh and it's now faced with a calamity so i am very very intrigued to see how uh that calamity sort of dissipates through the vibrant world world that we have just seen have you considered that so far can you tell me a bit about it uh, con uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Considered what exactly? So the the world has stopped spinning, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So what happens now with this wonderful world that we we just saw at the end? Exactly. Well, that is what the game is about, and that is what the uh, what the game will will explore. You as the character explore what must be done in order to prevent this calamity, and uh, what kind of sacrifices has to be made. Oh, you need to prevent it, so it's it hasn't happened before, uh, uh, yet. It, it it hasn't happened yet, but maybe it has happened already several times before. 
Okay, very intriguing, even more cool. Well, thank you, Louis, so much for your time. Uh, and I think now we will move on to John, uh, who is joining us from Ireland. Uh, and who has drawn more squirrels in this semester than anyone has in their lifetime. Uh, he will present to us the files of Liam Redsquire, who is trying to uncover the uh, secrets of the crooked big maple. John? <laughs> hi, Maruna. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction and hi, Shar. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for tuning in. And uh, um, I'm here to present a game that, that doesn't really take itself uh, uh, very seriously, so I have a short presentation um, to that effect. I will just share screen. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully you can see this. Um, talking into the void. So the files of Liam Redsquire. This was a second semester ITU games project for uh, game world design where the, the task is to uh, make an explorable slice of a world. And um, uh, myself and, and Mikkel Bense, Matthias, Rego and Magnus came together. Um, we kind of gathered around this idea of uh, we wanted to make something mysterious. We wanted to have a kind of a sense of humor. Um, again, not take itself too seriously. Um, they kind of liked this hand-drawn style um, that we'd come up with. And, uh, and rain was another uh, big factor. So. Uh, these were all the things that we wanted to, to yeah, get across in this uh, short project. So our, um, our pitch, yeah, um, Liam is a hard-boiled journalist squirrel investigating the mysteries of the big maple. It's a point-and-click homage to film noir where you ask questions, rustle feathers, and look after your nuts. So this is a, a point-and-click game that uh, has a lot of the tropes of uh, point-and-click games. And it's pointing, clicking, exploring, a lot of dialogue, a lot of clickable objects. Um, and we really wanted to lean into uh, um, uh, kind of film noir and explore uh, what could all the crazy things be going on um, on the side of a tree. So yeah, it's a little um, adventure that you're going to walk around in, uh, meet some people, and yeah, it all takes place on the, on the side of a tree. Um, so there are uh, this noir animal investigator uh, genre has been explored by a couple of titles, even saw on the Steam Games Festival recently. Um, but our world kind of leans more towards the animal side rather than uh, uh, the sort of animals that behave like humans. Our animals are a lot closer to animals. They don't really understand what's going on in the world. Um, so yeah, an homage to Film Noir and Point and Click. These were um, kind of games and, and uh, uh, an aesthetic that really brought us together. Um, during the semester, we watched a lot of uh, Film Noir um, to try and get an idea, you know, what was the, the, the dialogue kind of like, um, what were the, the typical sort of characters like, the sort of archetypes. Um, and yeah, this, uh, uh, these point and click games of the 90s uh, really inspired us as well for, again, this sort of a flair, sense of humor and, and mystery. Um, as regards, like having this uh, as a setting for a game world design project, we thought it was really useful because our squirrel was going to be an outsider and in point and click games, uh, you're generally you know, asking a lot of questions about the world. So yeah, this is a really good uh, vessel for our game world design exploration. Um, and our cast, we have uh, lots of characters in our game. They're inspired by the animal world. So they kind of, their their personalities or their, their place in society comes from what sort of animal they are, where do they rank in the food chain? So the mice are kind of at the bottom and then the owls are at the top. In fact, that's also where they live on the tree. Um, the, the mice live at the bottom and do all the menial tasks and the owls live up at the top where they've got casinos and um, are just enjoying themselves all the time. Um, so I might just uh, mention kind of what the story is. Uh, you play as Liam, or at least you're following Liam around. He's a heartbroken squirrel. Um, the love of his life has left him because uh, she's migrated. But um, as I've mentioned, the animals don't really understand uh, migration. So this was a big uh, uh, breakup for Liam and he decided to leave and move to a new place. Here we see him talking with Lilac Maple. She's the femme fatale. And uh, she's getting Liam to investigate a, a break-in uh, down at the docks, um, which we call the, the takeoff for a missing necklace. But Liam doesn't realize that this is actually a wild goose chase. Um, uh, Lilac is in, in cahoots with the owls and uh, Liam is kind of doing the, the dirty work of the bad guys. Um, uh, the reality, the real mystery is that the leaves are falling off the tree, the tree is sick and there's a conspiracy afoot. There's, uh, Liam is making efforts to get to the bottom of it all, 
but um, inadvertently is following red herrings and he's leading innocent mice into the claws of the enemy. Um, so uh, there's lots of uh, different factions in our tree. Here we have uh, the, the mouse uprising uh, society and they stand for uh, liberty, equality and fraternity. Um, I, th I think this GIF kind of gets across that this game is absolutely packed with uh, 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 puns. If you blink, you might uh, uh, miss a joke. Um, and that was very important to us. Um, I just want to uh, take the, the last part of this presentation to just mention about our creative process, because uh, this was very important to us and something that we really learned in making this project. Um, we were kind of, uh, we wanted to be a little ambitious with what we could, uh, uh, you know, shove into this uh, one semester project. So we have lots of locations, lots of drawings that you can, uh, that are like clickable objects. You click on them more times and and you get this noir frame flashback. Is Liam talking to himself or is he talking to the player? Um, and the way we could achieve that is kind of, um, you know, not splitting our team into, into tech uh, um, and narrative and, and art, but rather um, everybody was kind of, we wanted to get everybody in the same page so we could all pitch in and, and sort of build these uh, uh, scenes. Um, yeah, so I don't think we would have been able to make as much as we've made if we didn't have uh, uh, all the people on board. And um, so in, in an effort to do that, uh, we had to get everybody on the same page. We did it with some one page design documents, um, you know, some some bits of story that are not included in our game. But if you read these little uh, uh, story snippets, that kind of gives you a picture of what the relationship between the owls and, and mice was before Liam ever got there. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, why did we decide that he would walk up the tree like Spider, like uh, Batman rather than Spider-Man? How did our conversation system work? All of these things we wanted to get everybody on the same page. And uh, the final little bit of insanity I want to show is like how we pulled off this uh, uh, 2D assets in a 3D world, which we affectionately call 3 or 3D. Um, and so yeah, we have these sort of uh, dioramas. But I just wanted to say uh, well done to all the other members of the team for. Uh, yeah, putting up with this uh, crazy project and, and, and well done for, yeah, w pulling together to make all these uh, world dioramas. Um, so our demo is available on itch. Thanks very much for, for listening to my ramblings and uh, open to any and all feedback. Hope uh, you enjoy playing it. I see the Illuminati also helped with your project. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the Illuminati tree. We try to fit. Illuminati tree. Amazing. Puns. I imagine you wrote as many puns as you drew squirrels. <laughs> yeah, just about. Yeah. Uh, okay, Shar, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Hi, John. Hey, Shar. <laughs> nice to see you. How's the home Good country? <laughs> Good old kicking, home cooking. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, loving the puns. Great pun game. Uh, very impressed with that. Uh, although I do think that the artist on the squirrel game that I'm making at the moment would take exception to your claim of having drawn the most squirrels. Uh, but yes, as you know, squirrels are very near and dear to my heart. So yeah, this played game it looks great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, this looks so great. Um, I really love it. I laughed. Uh, you couldn't hear me because I was muted, but I laughed three times uh, at various tree puns that you were saying during that time. Um, and yeah, I love the kind of like Monkey Island vibe you have going on there too. It's really great. Uh, so the question that I have for you is about the creative process actually, because you did a great job there of showing how you got all the team on board and everyone doing parts of the assets and everything like that. Um, but what I want to know is on the other side of that, you got to have some spreadsheets going on, right? You've got all those clickable assets, you've got all those dialogues, you've got all the different things that can happen based on stuff that's going on. How did you organize the, the back end of the story? Sure. Um, so we, uh, uh, I guess there's, there's tools out there like like Yarn or I think Yarn was what we used for this or, or Twine or similar things. Um, but I think like working in a, in a, you know, a very compressed time space where you actually don't have like a spatial office. Uh, uh, the one kind of rule that we had was that the game was always the golden reference. So if you were working on dialogue, you were working it right into the game like that's where oh, the wow. script okay was. yeah 
It's on uh, the edge. <laughs> yeah, on the edge, yeah. But we had to uh, kind of make our own, uh, like it's, uh, if anybody's familiar with Toonstruck, these icons that kind of, uh, uh, you know, you don't see the text of the question you're about to ask. You might see a maple leaf. So you know mm -hmm. that it's going to be a question about maple leaf. So that was uh, um, Ben say and Nick will fair play to them, uh, built this sort of conversation system on top of Yarn, um, which we probably should release as a plugin because I imagine it's quite useful. Yes, you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More tools out there, the better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but no, it looks fantastic. I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it this evening. I, I, cool. Well, yeah. enjoy. Get my squirrel action on. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the squirrel game scene is growing. Yeah. <laughs> So will Liam uh, follow actual red herrings in his inquiries? Oh, uh, color uh, only came in very late in the day. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I guess we could have actual red herrings. That would be very. Uh, uh, that's the sort of on the nose humor uh, that we want. Um, there was one clip that was there that was uh, uh, at this the takeoff, which is like the docks because everything is uh, shipped on birds. Uh, we, we say it's birded rather than shipped. Um, and, and the character you meet there is uh, Captain Jack, who is a sparrow. Um, but we never actually say, you know, Captain Jack the sparrow. Uh, um, and the, that's the sort of, you know, grown humor that we wanted to pack this game with. So if people like that, those sorts of jokes, there's a lot of that. I love it. <laughs> I'm just getting more excited here. <laughs> cool. Me too. I, I really, really can't wait to play it. So what would uh, Liam and Manny talk about if they would meet? Liam and Manny. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's a good, that's a good point. I think this is a lot like the, that second act in Grim Fandango where he gets stuck uh, and takes over the casino. Um, uh, uh, there's even like the sea bees, that's our, our, our mouse uprising, like are directly inspired by uh, uh, the sea bees and the, the that beatnik cafe. Uh, I, you know, they might find out that they're they're too close in character. In fact, we should stop drawing comparisons between that and the <laughs> yes, yes. No, let's stop. There is no no comparison between them. Okay, thank you so much, John. It was wonderful seeing the game and also your design process. It was very, very informative. And I'm sure uh, both our students and our audience now will benefit a lot from that. Uh, and now we will uh, move on to Nima who is a first year game student and has a passion for storytelling. He worked as a lead narrative designer for our next game, which is called Forest Demons, uh, and is a lighthearted narrative driven game full of demons that are manifestations of human superstitions. Nima, are you there? Nima. There you go. <laughs> I was pretty sure I wasn't uh, manually muted. Hi. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I guess I'll just give a quick shout out to the team before I'll show the video. Our tech team being uh, Emil, uh, Daria, and uh, Alexandra, and the design team being Alexandra, uh, Alexandra, Katrina, and I guess I was there as well a little bit. Um, yeah. So another team, another game from the game uh, game world design course this uh, semester. So let's just get to it. Hi there and welcome to our showcase of Forest Demons. My name is Nima and I'll be the one presenting this evening. This is the project we worked on for a game world design course this semester. We'll be showing portions of the game while presenting, so sit back and enjoy. For this course, the main objective was the game world itself and how to create an interesting and compelling world for the players. Our initial inspiration came from the classic Miyazaki movie My Neighbor Totoro. Drawing on the idea of woodland spirits, we imagined the village where these demons lived and decided to go for a light-hearted and fun slice of life narrative centered around life in the demon village. As we get near the town square, we can already see parts of the village, such as the signs and posts the demons have created to help each other. As we'll show later, they can be interacted with, as can a number of other objects in the village. With a combination of the items, such as the signs being held up by matchsticks and the surrounding flora, we hope to give players a good sense of the scale of the demons and the village. As for the demons themselves, we imagine them as manifestations of human superstitions. The different demons we encounter are, to varying degrees, based on superstitions, some more known than others. 
The main character has been in a deep slumber only to awaken with amnesia and heads to the village square in hopes of regaining its memories. Here we interact with the knock on wood daemon, a common superstition who are both warding off bad luck. The different superstitions heavily influence the daemon's design, as we can see with knock on wood, who is a very wooden daemon that's rooted to the spot enjoying the water of the fountain. Yes, there are tons of silly puns and the like in this game. Anyway, the main goal of the game is the request given by Knock on Wood, as the fountain hasn't been active lately, and the main character enthusiastically offers to help. We can interact with all the demons in the game, even those who do not offer help in the main quest, like this sunshy vampire-esque daemon. Next we have the village shopkeeper, a savant at finding magical seeds which it trades for shinies. While most daemons sport smiles all the time, we see that they can also be grumpy and short-tempered. Here we get a good look at the town square and see how the daemons use everyday items for their village, such as the piggy bank the shopkeeper lives in, the dice chairs and the uno cards that serve as a makeshift shelter. We are told here that this collector can help us with our little shiny problem, so off we are to the residential area. Here we have some object interaction as well as a salty daemon. Oh, better move on. The residential area is where most daemons live. Once again we can see houses made from household objects such as hats and teapots. And of course, more puns. We also have allusions to human, like, like here when the black cat daemon talk about the big ones. Here we'll show some more object interaction, like the signs on the doors. As well as some of the more uh, silly interactions. Lastly we have the unlucky number 13 daemon, telling us where to find the collector, the daemon that can help us with our shiny for the shopkeeper. Once again we, hide to, uh, once again we allude to the big ones and how the daemons need to be careful around them. We are now nearing the end of our showcase, so we unfortunately will not be talking to the collector, the most interesting daemon in the world. We hope you enjoyed what you've seen, and if you want to know what the collector has to say, you should definitely go play Forest Demons. Thank you so much, Nima. Uh, I am going to go uh, download Forest Demons now, as you told me to, uh, and I will pass on the word to Char. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, it's a super great job, Nima. I love it. I, sure. the, I think my favorite thing in that uh, in that little uh, show wheel you showed is actually the environmental sounds. The, the sound design is so cozy uh, with all of the little burbling birds and the little murmuring voices between the different demons. I really uh, feel like even when you close your eyes, you feel like you're in a, in a real place. Um, it's just that's really, really wonderful. I also love the design with the household items like the hat house and the little playing cards everywhere. It's just really, really cute. Um, and my question is, uh, I'm also going to take no shiny, no seed as my uh, <laughs> phrase of the day that I'm going to try and get in somewhere. But yeah. uh, what kind of research you did into the different superstitions and what kind of ways you think the different superstitions might interact with each other narratively, um, like if you were to develop this further? Yeah, so... Um... A part of this project began with the idea of guard the uh, classical Danish myth of the Nisse, like the gnomes being uh, a superstition that teases humans. They they they're mischievous, so that's where we started. But somewhere along the road, we found that we didn't just want to stick to that superstition, and we just kind of thought it would be kind of cool to just look at all kinds of superstitions. So we kind of Googled them <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and just thought like, what kind of superstitions would be really fun if that was a kind of living being. Um, and that's why we came with the idea. The knock on wood character was originally a character that couldn't talk, could only knock on itself to kind of uh, do like a weird kind of what you call um, uh, the one where now I forgot. 
the one where you uh, do the SOS. This what's the uh, uh, Morse code? Morse code. There is one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so kind of like a primitive uh, woody Morse Morse code. Um, and along the way, we just we just brainstormed a ton of kind uh, different kinds of superstitions, and we just took like the 10, 15 best that we thought could have made really cool characters. We had to scrap a lot of really nice characters though. Yeah, um, it happens. Since, yeah. <laughs> so, but like for statements 2.0, we will have all the characters. Don't worry about it. Well, I can't wait for that. They are so cute. I, if you made any merch of this, I would buy all of it, literally. Um, they are amazingly creative, uh, and I think uh, it leaves you a lot of space to, to expand into the different cultures that you can explore. Um, and the, thank you, Nima. I think uh, due to time, we will move uh, a, a bit quicker, and we will move on to Marlene. Uh, who is going to present Unfolding, which is a text-based narrative experience where the player acts as a writer that, who authors a series of stories taking place during the lockdown. So it's a very uh, present-oriented uh, game. Marlene, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Hi, yes, perfect. Hello. <laughs> Great. All right, well, uh, hello, I'm Marlene, as you just said, and um, Unfolding is a work in progress game that we're currently making as a thesis, me and Jordi, which is my friend, and Jordi is a programmer, and I'm the writer on this project, and incidentally, I'm also doing a lot of UI, which I didn't think through, and it's very hard, but uh, anyways, our game and thesis is about collaborative storytelling, and we're interested in seeing how we can make digital games evoke the feeling of writing a story rather than uh, reading or playing it or more than that. And now I'm just going to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. There we go. Uh, oh, yes. All right. So like uh, you said, Maruna, this is about, uh, we wrote this story about the lockdown. Uh, basically, we think that there are a lot of interesting experiences, experiences arising from like this new state we're in and also to be honest this is where our inspiration came from because we were in lockdown while we were writing this so um this is like a maybe love story about two people who meet uh, once before the lockdown and then they keep running into each other during the lockdown and then you kind of get to experience how the dynamics uh, are affected by the lockdown situation and so one of the ways that we're making you feel like you're writing the story is, for example, this example you're seeing here. The first text that you're seeing is, let's write a story about two people. So this is kind of like the inner monologue of the writer thinking I should start writing a story. And the way the system works is that you click on that link and then you replace it with the option. So now it says, I think it starts off a bit cliche. So we're kind of digging deeper into these thoughts. And now we're getting what the actual story says. Like now we're in Mija's rest, we're in this bar, she's saying, what are you drinking? And now they're having a conversation. And so you can keep going here. And like, this is quite simple to begin with. We are kind of just easing the player in and you have some simple choices. Now, what I want to show you is like how our system gets interesting. Like there's a lot of tech going on here in the background. Some of it is uh, using tracery, if you know about that, but I won't talk too much about the tech since we don't have a lot of time. But I can show you here that now we have several links at the same time. And that means that the player can kind of choose the order that they want to do this in. So uh, if they feel more enticed about writing the, the ending first, they can do that. And I think that mirrors the feeling uh, of, of being the writer more because then you're actually thinking, uh, you're going to the, the bits that you're interested in or the bits that you know about already. And, and some of this feels like flavor. So it's like, uh, is she playing with her hair or is she not shaking her phone? It's kind of the same deal. But if we say he talks about, he talks about his dog and now something pops up on this option and it says dog mentioned true. This is a really ugly programmery and it will not be like this in the ending. But bear with me, this is an effect hooked up to the option, which means that the doc has been mentioned and this can matter later. So this basically can later on become a condition on another option. So it will only be available if the doc has been mentioned. And um, if you see here, like now we're jumping back into the writer's voice. 
because you see that clearly that now it's in first person, I need to figure out how the night ends. And now we have two choices that also have effects. Either she's physical or she's calm. And that's the kind of choice that will determine the dynamics um, throughout their relationship. So for example, if she's physical, you might have some options unlocked that will make her a bit more forward physically. Like maybe she'll reach for a hug and that will make him a bit uncomfortable because he's not really up for that in this situation. So it's kind of like the tension and the romance is constantly conflicting uh, like uh, in, in this kind of battle throughout the, the story. And as a last little thing I want to show is these beautiful post-its to the left. So you actually have these goals that you set up in the beginning of the game for how the arc should look and what you want to reach. So you have these effects that you want to reach. And you should, of course, by the end of our project, like when our game is finished, be able to like, change your mind for this arc. Uh, as you go, if you feel like the story is actually should move in a different direction. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Like we have a playable prototype, we'll share a link and we would love some feedback on what the current state is. So this is a small story of a couple of chapters. And yeah, thank you for the attention. And now I need to figure out how to get out of screen sharing. And uh, yeah, I think that worked. Oh, escape works. See, cool. Yes. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, that looks like a wonderful tool. I think I need that for my PhD. Um, <laughs> Char, do you have uh, some words? Yeah, I also need it. I need it for everything. <laughs> I think there's so much potential in this. Uh, like not only to make games with that are writing based, but also for people to use as writing inspiration or even for like as a game development, like as a tool that's part of the process and um, for people who are considering different options and uh, putting putting in things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, do you, have you thought about, have you thought about uh, expanding it in that way? Uh, I think we talked about it could, definitely become a tool by the end of this but I mean that's really up to Jordi he's the he's the programmer <laughs> um but uh yeah no I don't know like I think I think it's definitely something that's interesting to prototype in but it's also something that's really complicated to write in like I when I'm sitting with it um uh, it's it becomes brain like a lot of branches very very fast and you have a lot of stuff to take into account mm -hmm. so we at this point we don't have as much of that kind of fragments of sentences that you swap we don't have as much that we as we would like um because it's just complicated to do it and you need to make bits of story that are pretty modular so you can move it around and not think too much about where the player has been uh, other than you know the effects and conditions that we're hooking up yeah um, I also can see a lot of uh, potential for uh, players who are playing to get, like who are trying to play the game you're giving them, which is to make a particular story. But then they actually get like kind of sucked into your words and your story and they're like, no, but I, I, want, I want things to go a different way. And they, they want to make it their own. Um, yeah. Have you any ideas, I mean, around perhaps like having some sort of sharing for that at the end so people can share where their stories went, or how they well, made their stories? That's a good idea. We didn't think about that. Uh, we do have analytics in there. <laughs> so <laughs> we want to like see how people play. Yeah. Like, it would be really interesting to see if some choices are just, um, yeah, more interesting. Like for example, um, if everyone chooses for the two of them to kiss at the bar, uh, even though I think it might be super interesting to make them not kiss and actually just kind of like, you know, the night just ends kind of disappointingly and maybe that creates some tension when they see each other again like there's a lot of opportunities to make it a maybe more interesting story in that way so yeah uh, there is absolutely huge potential in this i i have to say i'm really really excited about this project i really want to see where you go with it and where you take it because i feel like this is the kind of thing you could be uh like teaching students how to write games with in the next few years so i'm Thank you. really excited about it i'm going to keep following it and Thank well you. done to you and Jordi. That means a lot. Thanks. Yeah, I also think it, this has huge potential, uh, especially given the fact that uh, it's a game about a lockdown. Uh, if you would put a sharing option, uh, it would bring people together, sharing their stories, the stories that they have worked on while they, while they were separated. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that's a possibility that you would work uh, with in the future? 
uh i mean at this point we have so much other stuff to do <laughs> yeah um, good luck with your thesis yeah, <laughs> it's thank a you. stressful thank time <laughs> yeah yeah definitely but i think it's a cool idea and i'll definitely mm -hmm. talk to you about it yeah Okay, cool. Thank you, Marlon. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Char, for your wonderful comments uh, and uh, your inspiration for our students. Uh, you guys stay tuned. We're going to go on a break now, uh, but we will be back with the next session uh, at six. Bye.